Hey everyone and welcome back to the channel. In this week's video we are so excited to be sharing and exploring Bolsover Castle. The castle is known as the fantasy hilltop pleasure palace of a horse-mad cavalier, poet and playboy named William Cavendish. It's here inside these walls that you will be transported to a lost age of aristocratic extravagance as you discover lavishly decorated rooms, the astonishing riding school and the richly coloured wall paintings that make this building one of England's most unfound treasures. So why not join us as we explore Bolsover Castle? This is no ordinary castle. Here you can see the riding stables where King Charles's riding master, William Cavendish, first commissioned his 17th century riding house. William would bring in horses from all over the world to train them in his passion for dressage, making the castle a landmark in British equestrianism. Yet outside of his love for horses, William liked the finer things in life and loved art decor and this is reflected in the so-called little castles, remarkable wall paintings and interiors, which can still be seen today. As a renowned playboy, William loved nothing more than a good party, and Bolsover Castle certainly hosted many, many that I would have loved to have seen. On our first look around the site, it's hard to be able to visit every single room for the video without it being hours long, so we have left some of the rooms out, so that you get the chance to explore here for yourself and you'll be blown away by the labyrinth and discoveries behind these rooms. The first building that we enter is the Riding House Range. This entire range was devoted to housing, training and maintaining horses. Now half of the range is home to the museum that houses the backstory and the origins to Bolsover. There is plenty of interactive displays and information that gives you great insight into the lives and the people here who lived in the castle. One of the highlights in this room is the highly ornate oak door that once led onto the Little Castle Wall Walk. The distinctive and impressive weathered door was designed by William's architect, John Smithson. The detailing on this door shows the precise attention to detail that William would have sought after. It is now very weathered, but it may have once been painted a deep earthy red, much like the other doors around the castle. The riding house was split off onto three different sections, a smithy, a shoeing house with a gallery above and a riding house with a stable complete with lodgings in the garrets. The large room we get to enter inside is the amazing riding house. This is in fact the oldest riding school in England to survive intact. Huntington Smithson also designed the riding house range for Sir William Cavendish who was an expert horseman in the art of manege. The sophisticated architectural detailing of the stables and riding house reflects the status of these valuable manege horses. In 1658 Sir William wrote a book on training horses that advocated mutual respect between the horse and the rider rather than using brute force. His teachings were the foundation for the modern sport of dressage. The beautiful interior of the riding house is a fine example of the Italian influence designs that are prevalent around Bolsover Castle. Even today it retains much of the grandeur that it must have exhibited when it was first built. The oak beams were originally hidden by a ceiling, but it perhaps looks grander today with the beams now on show. The riding house was not used to teach people to ride horses, but rather to teach the horses the art of manege. From an early age, horses were extremely important to William. His family kept and trained their own to high standards at Wellback Abbey, their Nottinghamshire country house. And by the 1630s, he had the aspiration to become the royal master of horse. William wrote two books on horsemanship, 
the first and only significant British contributions to the development of the art. In the 12th century, a defensive castle was built on the site for William Peveril, with a stone keep added by Henry II around 1173. It remained in royal ownership up until 1553, when it was granted to the 6th Earl of Shrewsbury, the fourth husband of Bess of Hardwick. Through that marriage, the property passed to Sir Charles Cavendish. The next building and range that we walk into is the Terrace Range. This range was developed by William in separate stages between the late 1620s and the 1660s. Walking underneath the elaborate family crest of the Cavendishes, you enter inside the large and impressive dining room. Can you imagine being invited to dine in such a grand and lavish room? Although now ruinous, with only skeleton remains and sandstone walls, this would have been the place to wine and dine, and show off to his affluent pals. Through the door behind us, there would have been an enormous withdrawing chamber, and its lodging chamber with a grand great bed. This dining room, along with the other splendid rooms, would boast expensive tapestries, court furnitures and ruling paintings, as well as a massive painting of William, full head to toe in armour, hung amongst the wall behind us, reminding people just whose palace this was. Both the ground floor and first floor rooms of the northern end of this terrace range are best seen from the basement, but using this platform to overlook the entire area, you are able to make out the various rooms and uses from above. The kitchens were in the basement, beneath the hall that we're standing on, and of course were designed for maximum productivity. A scullery led directly to the clerk's office, where valuables such as silver plates and spices would be checked in and out. William was a man famed for his elaborate self-presentation and loyalty to the crown, which came together in theatrical entertainments for the king and queen, one written especially for their visit to Bolsover. A love of the arts and desire for a high place at court meant that William was frequently troubled for cash, but this never stopped him in his pursuit for beauty and position. So it was not only William's love for horses and the arts that draw you to this castle, but it's the story of William and his second wife, Margaret Cavendish. Margaret was 22 and William was 52, but age didn't matter to the pair. They had so much in common with their love of writing and plays that they fell madly in love with one another. Marrying in the same year and moving to Rotterdam and later Antwerp, they returned to England when the monarchy was restored in 1660 and I have read on occasions that she was actually often nicknamed Mad Madge, when really the exact opposite was true. Margaret was a highly intelligent woman who was interested in science, art, laboratories and literature. She was a prolific writer of books and essays on these topics and much more, including a biography of her husband William his poetry and plays which often reflected her life experiences. Margaret wrote one of the first novels in English and one of the first ever works of science fiction. Best of all, William actively encouraged these interests of his wife, who was 30 years younger than himself. He often spoke out about the reasons that she was being criticised as being unladylike and socially inappropriate in her pursuits as pure sexism. In Margaret, he saw an intellectual equal, which made it a very unique relationship, especially for the times, but somewhat inspiring. They received a huge amount of criticism for this, meaning that they often spent long periods away from court, but that didn't stop them in showing genuine love and acceptance for each other's talents. The exile they endured until the restoration of Charles II in 1660 didn't actually hinder their enthusiastic collecting of books and scientific instruments, amongst other things, a hobby that they often shared together. The couple amassed a large collection of microscopes and telescopes during this period. 
but science wasn't the only interest that Margaret had. She also published a lot of material, starting with poems and fancies in 1653. At the time, as William was also a writer, they believed it was truly her husband, using her wife's name as a pen name. William always supported his wife, claiming it was always her own work. And Margaret did the same, but she did credit William as a writing mentor. As Billing suggests, the pair actually relied on each other in print in order to maintain a certain reputation in the public sphere. William as a supportive husband and a loyal subject to the king, and Margaret as a dutiful wife and writer in her own right. It was only for this that Margaret so wished to be remembered. Instead, society wished to rubbish her as a woman whose opinion on usually male-dominated topics that just weren't required. The first building phase of the current castle was between 1611 and 1617, following the footprint of an older medieval castle that was once in existence. This included the building known as the Little Castle, which was the main living accommodation until the terrace range was built in anticipation of a visit from Charles I and his wife, Henrietta Maria, in 1634. The little castle was built as William Cavendish's pleasure holiday home, as he mainly lived at Welbeck Abbey, nearby. For this reason, it was sumptuously decorated and furnished. Each room had a theme and relevant imagery, was used to show the classical and biblical knowledge of William. We took a slightly different route into the little castle. We started from the bottom to the top, making our way around the basement and exploring these rooms, before climbing the staircase to see the rooms on the second floor of the castle. Inside this floor you'll notice that the rooms are sectioned off into various bed chambers and have rooms that were rather large wardrobes. The most notable feature of the second floor is the central lantern. It was a place to be able to sit down and possibly enjoy some dessert and relax. It enabled free access and flow throughout the second floor. In these rooms you'll notice the extravagant fireplaces and panelling that would indicate the richness and the high status of these in particular rooms. One in particular that we enter inside with the black and cream fireplace is thought to be where William's mother would have slept. This room is also called the room that would give light to Harwick because it's said that you would be able to see Hardwick from this room and that Hardwick could be seen from here. I think for me the star of the show and this building has to be the star chamber, one of the most popular rooms of the house for quite obvious reasons. Upon entering inside you are blown away with the beautiful woven tapestries, the elaborately decorated star ceiling and the royalty that this room oozes in atmosphere. It was refurnished in 2014 to replicate what it may have once looked like in the Stuart era, but I think we can all agree on how homely and extravagant this room is. The tapestries are not original to the house, they were actually reproduced versions of original 17th century tapestries found at Blickling House in Norfolk. 
They were recreated by using 3D printing onto linen, but are still really effective. The star chamber itself was created as the main entertaining and reception space for the castle. It would have originally been furnished with a large table to eat from, as well as many seats to be used, either during banqueting or for watching or listening to entertainment, with a raised dais to be used by William and either his first wife Elizabeth or his second wife Margaret. The reason the room is called the Star Chamber is because at some point following William's death, an auditor named the rooms in an inventory. The ceiling featured 254 gold leaf stars and it was restored in 2000 when the coving had to be redone. And during this process, the ceiling colour was changed. Prior to this, the colour had been a dark blue to represent the night sky. Also during the restoration, an original 17th century playing card was found underneath the coving. This was probably put there by one of the craftsmen who worked there, hoping to be remembered in some way centuries after he had completed the work. Unfortunately, the card is now at the British Museum, but it is only one of many hidden treasures found secreted away in many country houses across the country. In this next room, we entered inside and were instantly blown away with the sumptuous and grand panelling. It's named the Pillar Parlour and it was an intimate dining chamber. King Charles I and Queen Henrietta Maria were more than likely served a grand banquet in this room when they visited Bolsover in 1634. The design and panelling is painted to imitate a walnut colour, which was embellished with gold. The design was mimicked from the Royal Palace of Theobalds in Hertfordshire, which is one of the most elegant mansions in England. All around the room, the paintings are set into the panelling, and they depict the five senses from prints copied from Franz Floris. Bolsover Castle, in a nutshell, is just spectacular. You could spend hours here exploring and delve into the pleasures of one man's life, and a day spent within its walls offers not only the enjoyment of a lovely building, but it's also an insight into a fascinating man. The amount you get to see and enjoy and experience here makes for the perfect day out for anybody. Just being able to understand and walk the rooms of those more fortunate than ourselves, letting us get a glimpse into the lives is one I'll remember for a long time. So that's it for this week and we really hope that you've enjoyed exploring Bolsover Castle as much as we have. So if you have, please be sure to hit that like button, click the notification bell and press that subscribe button so you'll never miss a video. We want to say a big thank you and welcome to the wonderful man that is wandering with Watto for joining us over on Patreon. We really and truly appreciate your support. If anyone is interested, we would love your support over on our Patreon or here on YouTube as channel members. So we'll see you on the next one. Till next time.